Have you ever started building a model that was supposed to be a palette cleanser, quick and easy to build, and then it suddenly got out of hand with more detail? Well, that's what happened to me in Takem's M31 and 135 scale. There was a few things in this kit that I decided could be better, and I ended up on a rabbit hole that took me three months to complete the project. It started out innocently enough as I filled in seams where parts joined together for the transmission cover, and then used some glue and a stiff brush to bring out the casting texture, but then when the tanks started going together, I realized it could be a little bit better. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with the kit itself. This is the second project I've built from Takeum, the first being their Stug, and the kits are pretty well done for what is a budget level kit. You could build it out of the box and be happy with how it looks at the end, but I enjoy adding a little bit more of a, my own personal touch by adding in some casting flaws with a drill bit, and then basically improving on some detail that Takeum may have missed or left very simple. But if there's one thing I can tell you about building any of the Lee kits, it's a tip I got from Jensen Taylor over at the Plastic Posse podcast. And that is, don't follow the instructions for building the upper hull. And the reason for that, you'll actually get a little bit of a gap at the top of the glacis plates where the roof sits down. Unfortunately, I didn't figure that out or talk to him until after I glued everything together. All in all, that was only something that took me a few minutes of filling and sanding to clean up. Otherwise, the kit goes together pretty well. You just really have to pay attention of what holes you need to drill or leave undrilled depending on the variant you're building. For the first time building the tank, I finally remembered to paint the interior black, that way all the windows didn't let you see the empty hull. Now the M3 Lee is not a tank I'm necessarily interested in. I don't really like the look of it, having two turrets, it just looks bulky and weird. And you might be saying, Robbie, tanks are bulky and weird, that's why they're cool. And I'm probably going to have to disagree with you a little bit. But I do like the look of the M31. I don't know if it's the case that you just took an ugly tank and made it uglier. And now it actually looks cooler because it's got all the tank recovery stuff hanging off of it. Kind of like how garrison goggles work, where that girl that's been a 5 for the last 6 months suddenly starts looking like an 8. Takeum did a pretty good job designing and engineering how the boom was going to go together on this tank. But there's one thing they forgot. And that was the actual hook on the end of the cable. I'm not sure how you forgot that, but that's a thing. Now the boom itself is a little fiddly as you're trying to put it together, but as you add more and more components, it actually starts to strengthen up and would actually take a little bit of weight if you wanted to hang a tank or something off of it. Included with the boom are the outriggers where you can actually position pin to the front of the tank, the rear, or even offset, whatever you see fit. After checking out a few builds of M31s, I found that quite a few of them had a lot of slack in the guide wires on the boom. And the way I understand it is this is set to take some of the weight of the load, so it should be taut. So what I did was replace the kit wire with some copper wire and ended up cutting the wire just a tad short so it would have tension on it. But that introduced some other problems because now I needed to reinforce the pulley at the base of the boom with some brass tubing. That way I didn't have to worry about the styrene giving out over time or snapping. There's also some styrene guide pins for the cable going around the pulley, and I replaced those with brass as well. That way there is a lot more support. With just those few steps, I now had the cables looking like they properly had tension on them. With that step complete, I put the turret and boom together and left those to the side for easier painting. Now it was time to replace some of the grab handles with some more brass rod. One of the nice things about using brass rod instead of the styrene grab handles is they hold up to handling the tank a bit more and you can actually bend them if you wanted to have them damaged. You also don't have to worry about cleaning up the seam lines. Another part of the kit that called for an upgrade were the storage boxes. Where the actual latches were was just a nub of plastic. So I drilled, cut them away, drilled two holes, and just bent some copper wire around a needle. And that gave me a nice latch. After that I used some lead wire and bent that around the latch to look like it was the strap. Because the M31 didn't have any actual armament, one common field upgrade was for crews to install a 50 cal on the roof for self-defense. This 50 cal was donated from Takem's Jeep kit that I had in the stash. 
Another item to upgrade on the tank was the spare track holders. I'm not sure what Takem was going for with their rendition of it, but it was a quick thing to do in Fusion 360 to design some actual straps and the spare tracks. I modeled these tracks after the aftermarket ones I had and made sure they would fit into the mounts. Once these were all glued together and flipping one upside down just to cause it to irritate some people, they were ready to be glued on the back of the tank. And having them side by side, it definitely looked a lot better. The one very real siren call of 3D printing is once you start to replace some things, you start to notice other parts of the kit that you could also replace. And that's a very dangerous game to play because the next thing you know, you're spending a week and a half trying to design your own track links. One very easy upgrade to do to a model tank is adding your own cables for the lighting equipment. In this case, I actually lost the left hand side stop light so I drilled two mounting holes there to make it look like it had been knocked off. Just using some lead wire and tube, I then added in the harness behind it. I've had this jeweler's chain in my drawer for a while, and it looked like it would work well as a 1 35th scale toe chain. So I printed off some toe hooks on the resin printer, and then used a drill and brass tube to again pin it to have it work. It may be a little bit of work trying to pin the hook through the chain, but in this case I found that the juice was worth the squeeze. Because the chain was metal, it would hang and look like it had weight to it. On the M31, these hatches were welded shut, so to do that I would use some two-part epoxy and my homemade Pepsi can toothpick welding tools, patent pending. Feeling that the tank still needed some more greeblies, I printed off some acetylene and oxygen tanks to mount to the side. Tacom doesn't include any storage with their kits, so to make the tank look a little more lived in, I took some spare parts from a Tamiya kit. Seeing that modern recovery vehicles have chains usually in place ready to be used, I figured that was the same story in World War II, so I created another chain just to throw on the front of the tank, and with that, it was ready for paint. The tank was primed with two thin coats of Tamiya Oxide Primer before I started in with the green base using AK Real Colors Olive Drab. One difference I noticed between using red primer and a gray primer is that the red primer gave me a better base to work with to add some tonal variety. It also makes the paint on top look a little bit warmer. Once the Olive Drab base was down, I then put some AK Real Color Faded Olive Drab in a cup and started highlighting some of the top areas of the panel to make it look less blocky. Because this specific M31 was used in Operation Cobra, it was going to need some black camouflage added to the olive drab. Now black was too stark on top of that brown green color, so I started with some rubber black from Tamiya and then highlighted it a little bit with German grey. And just like the olive drab tones, I made them a little bit lighter towards the top of the vehicle. Because I needed a lot of control for this part of the painting, I used my PS270 Pro Comboy. This ensured that I had a nice, soft demarcation between the two colors. One thing I enjoy about doing tanks over aircraft is that there's very few decals you have to work with. So after those decals were on, I sealed everything under a few thin coats of semi-gloss. Because I used a lacquer gloss on top of acrylic paints, I now had a nice barrier before coming in with chipping. Because I'm using acrylic paint on top of that lacquer, if I overdo the chipping or if I just don't like it, I can just use a moistened brush and wipe it away and restart. For the chipping color, I mixed two parts Vallejo Khaki to one part Vallejo Ghost Grey, and I used that for the scratches as well using a very fine tipped brush. Moving into detail painting, I continued using Vallejo color paints. If there's any whoopsies with the paint, it's a simple matter of cleaning it up. Now to set the base for rust in the high wear areas, I used neutral gray and ghost gray before coming in with an enamel rust wash. And this just adds a lot of variety into the chains. For reference, I used the chains at work that we use to hoist things. And it was also the same place that provided references for the oxygen bottle and the acetylene bottle. So purists might get mad about this, but I do like the little bit of color it adds 
If you happen to work in a shop or visit an automotive shop, check out their cutting torches. You'll see multiple layers of paint, chipping, and they're just interesting to look at. I'm sure some of the guys at work thought I was weird when I took a picture of a set, but hey, you gotta use the references where you find them. Is it historically accurate? Probably not. But I won't lie, when I'm building tanks, they're meant to be a fun project for me, and I don't get too carried away with being accurate. I found this part of the build the most fun because rust tones is not something I generally get to do on an aircraft. And because there's all the tools and chains and bare metal, I got to have a lot of fun doing this. If you're wondering where all the information is in the video for what paints I'm using, they're actually been moved to the detail section. And that just saves me about four hours of video editing. So if you want to know what I've used, check details below. With all the brush painting completed on the tank, it was now time to move on to the pin wash. I didn't want the pin wash to have too much contrast with the main paint, so I had to find something that would work with the black and the olive drab. And I ended up using a panel liner wash for green and brown with a few drops of black in it. This was dark enough that the details would stand out a little bit more, but not so dark that the tank looked like a cartoon. During the 48 in 48 fundraiser with the model officer's mess that was live streamed, I did decide to go with a high contrast paint just to see how it would look in person. And although I did like it, it's not a style I think I would stick with all the time. I definitely preferred the look that this M31 had. To have the chain that was going to hang from the boom look a little bit different than the one on the tank, I added a few darker rust tones just to have it pop a little bit more. Again, because I used jeweler's chain, it was very easy to get this into place. Just not trying to keep it in focus while you're doing it. That was a different challenge. To set the base for the weathering on the lower hull, I used some AK textured mud. This way, when I put some paint and colors on top of it, it looked like that the mud had been building up over time and it wasn't just paint. To keep that acrylic mud from just sucking in paint, I sealed it with a quick blast of lacquer paint. And this was a mix of brown and gray. I went a little bit lighter on my mud tones and more browner because I wanted them to still stand out and not get lost in the green tank. Once the lacquer paint had dried, I then came in with some oils and started flicking some on to add some more random buildup. Then it was a case of coming in with some darker oil paints and then wet blending those, adding some streaking, and then going to a final darker color just to give the mud some life. If you've ever gone off-roading in a truck or any vehicle, you'll see as it starts to dry that it doesn't all dry at the same time. Different, heavier areas dry slower than areas that are lightly covered. The last layer to go on was some MIG wet mud. While this was still wet, I used a brush with some enamel thinner on it to blend everything together. Now for the part of building tank models that I don't enjoy, and that is the monotony of putting together the track links. Now, maybe I shot myself in the foot getting aftermarket tracks to build, but even building ones out of kits, they just can get boring. And that's the same as when it comes to painting them and weathering them. I will take doing aircraft seams over tracks any day of the week. After painting the tracks with a lacquer tire color from Mr. Color, I came in with an acrylic neutral gray and white just to add some base for the rust tones on top. Checking out some reference photos, it looked like these track pins rusted up pretty quick, and this was the fastest and easiest way to make those match. Then it was just a case of coming in and repeating all the same steps from the lower hull on the track links themselves. Once that was done, I used a cloth with a little bit of enamel thinner on it to wipe off the chevrons because these would generally keep themselves clean. And with that, the build was complete. Before this video ends, I'd just like to take a moment to thank my patrons for their support. If you're interested in behind the scenes pictures, blog posts, or even one week early access to videos depending on the tier you're at, make sure you sign up over to Patreon. If that's not your bag, that's okay. Make sure you hit subscribe to this channel and make sure you've set all notifications. 
I appreciate everybody's patience as well because this channel got off to a slow start this year. I'm not going to bore you with the details of making sure you're saving to two different locations and that your kids don't have access to your camera you used to film with, but we should be back to our regular scheduled programming. And after this M31, you should be seeing one of my top builds I've been wanting to do, but I've been putting off for a little bit. This is the model guy. I appreciate your time and I will see you in the next video.